Everything was overseas. We were safe here. We didn't have the fears of somebody coming over and hurting us. We were hurting everybody else. Lillian Braun was born on Valentine's Day, 1920, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. When she turned five, Lillian moved to Beloit, Wisconsin, and has lived there until this day. It was nothing like now. We played in the streets. There weren't that many cars. We went to grade school, to junior high. We walked. There were no buses. Uh, we lived near the schools at that time. We didn't live out in the country. We went to country schools. We didn't have what everybody's got now. Uh, our folks, some of our parents lived on farms. Uh, my father was in the shoe business in Milwaukee, and they moved him from, to Beloit when Freeman Shoe opened their second plant. And he was a shoe cutter in Milwaukee, but when he moved to Beloit, he was a foreman. And so um, our life changed. We weren't uh, disadvantaged like a lot of people were. It was an interesting life. I, we traveled a lot. We did a lot of things. We had a lot over the years, but we sacrificed for it. When Lillian graduated from high school, she became an active member in the community. She became the secretary of Freeman Shoe Company in Plant 2. She was head of the credit union, and she also took care of Red Cross. One year, somebody, some man, I, there were mostly men, suggested my name for president. I was so frightened that I didn't even think of the word decline. I ended up president of the Bloyd chapter, Bloyd chapter of credit unions for one year. Had to run the meetings. I never was so scared in all my life. But I, I since have learned from that experience too. When the war started to surface, men were training and fighting and women began working. The boys were all gone, so the girls had to go to work. That's where the name Rosie the Riveter started, because uh, this particular gal, Rosie, ended up at one of the factories, and she was doing riveting of some sort. The women went to work. Everybody had to work. In some kind of manufacturing because there were no boys. They were all gone. So everybody's life was different. So I was there till I was 22 years old. And then I got married. And I'd went with this, my husband, from the time I was a junior in high school. In his teenage, he fell off a horse. They always had horses. And he broke his arm, and it went, this part went that way. And so it wasn't corrected very well when it was healing. And so during the war, we were uh, drafting all the young men. And he was 4F at that time. He was injured. Um, in growing up. So he couldn't go to the Army, but he had to go into manufacturing or farming. We got married in 1942, and his father bought a farm for us on Town Line Avenue in Beloit, outside of about five miles outside of Beloit, in 80 acres. And I had never been on a farm before. During the war, people were limited in ways they could receive news about the troops overseas. There was no television, just radios where we got the, and they were 
battery. I remember our first radio had a battery and um, we just got it through the newspapers, what we, information we'd get. And then we'd just sit and the static on the radio was so hard to understand. Or that we would get a report now and then or we got it through the UFOs or the boys that came back. But they couldn't tell us anything. They were just so happy, but there were a lot of deaths at that time too. I had uh, I had three brothers, and two of them served. They went in the army, and one, I think Bud was in the navy. And we'd write letters back and forth to them. That's one thing we did. We always wrote a lot of letters. They had never been outside of the city except maybe a trip to Milwaukee to see our grandparents. Well, you just kept writing letters, hoping they were coming home. And then slowly and surely, sooner or later, more and more boys came home and uh, your life became normal again. USOs, known as United Service Organizations, served as entertainment outlets for those who were waiting for their loved ones to return from battle. That's where a lot of the girls would go and dance with the boys when they came home. They were so anxious to see girls, and girls were so anxious to see boys. That was their entertainment, was to go to the USOs, and there would be bands and food, and it was just the activity of the city. But uh, it, people didn't travel at that time. You stayed right in your own little village or went to see grandma and grandpa, and that was about it. But when they went overseas, it just opened up a whole new world for children, high school kids, uh, learning how to fly, learning how to be alone. People didn't go to college like they do now. Just the wealthy went to college that went away to some city in the United States. They didn't go overseas. Nobody went overseas. It was just opened up the whole new world where people traveled. And then with the airplanes, we start flying. Everybody went by railroad, cars or railroad, streetcars. We didn't have many buses at that time either. So um, it just opened up a whole new world to finding out everybody was kind of alike. We thought the foreigners were foreigners. They talked a different language. Everybody you went to, it was another different language. And so they started coming over here and starting to learn English. They had to if they wanted to go to school and then they met girlfriends and boyfriends over there that they ended up marrying or they went over there to marry them. Or when they got furloughs, they got married and that's what happened to them. Everybody's family changed. Lillian lived on this farm for three years and took care of the chickens every day while her mother-in-law helped her with cooking. Around 1945, White and Lillian bought a new house. One day, White's parents went down to Belvedere, Illinois to get their dogs bred, and that farmer had some mink. The farmer talked them into the mink business, so they bought three bred females, took them home, and started to raise mink. I used to say, um, all the farmers dumb farmers and I found out they weren't dumb farmers that they had a big investment and uh, were very important to the economy. Lillian and Dwight ended up selling their 80 acre farm and putting livestock for around $18,000. Dwight and his father partnered up and named their mink business Dwight's Champion. While he was butchering a horse one day I was out there watching him and and he looked over to the neighbors and his father was with us uh, just chatting away. And they saw this land, three houses over. This was on Riverside Drive. And um, he said, you know, son, that would be some land that you could build a mink ranch. So they ended up buying this 
10 acres of land, three houses north of where he was raised. Europe was known for being one of the major mink farming productions in the world. Lillian and Dwight expanded their mink business by traveling overseas to Europe with other mink ranchers and visiting the businesses there. And um, we had organizations that we belonged to. Dwight ended up on the National Board of Fur Farmers and they had a meeting every year and we'd meet at different mink rancher areas in different states. So we did a lot of traveling over the years. Went to Malibu Mink Ranchers because he was treasurer of the National Board for a long time. But in the process, uh, my husband died in 201, December 10, 201, from cancer. And my son at that time was a partner, so he took over the mink business. And he stayed in it until three years ago. He's 67 now. And he pilled it out of the business. So now we've all the pens had to be disassembled, uh, disbanded, and cleaned up. The machinery sold, breeding stock sold. And through the years, we just had a beautiful life in the mink business. But enjoy your youth, whatever you do, because every birthday, something new happens health-wise. You lose friends, your sicknesses. Uh, this last year, I lost 40, I went to 40 different funerals. I'm in that age bracket where the 60s, 70s, 80s are dying now. And I'm lucky to be here in the health I'm in, and I'm thankful. Over the years, I think I've forgotten them. I'm lucky I'm remembering what I'm remembering. Most of my friends don't remember anymore at this age. The few I have left. And I had a lot of friends because we were in business. Dwight's folks were in business. I volunteered a lot. Uh, we lived in Beloit all our lives. Volunteered for church. So I knew a lot of people over the years. And so um, just keep busy and trying to help somebody else wherever they need it. You never know when you're going to need that person. We all make mistakes. So learn from your mistakes. I have. I've learned a lot from my mistakes. Enjoy your memory because your memory starts slipping away too. When I was 22, I heard on the radio, I was just married, and they had a breakfast at Sardi's in California, and they interviewed the woman. She was 80, and you had to be 80 to be on this program. He said, what do you attribute your good life to? She said, keep doing what you're doing, and you'll never grow old. So I repeated that. I was 22. I thought, God, I'm going to be old someday. I better remember that. I repeated it and repeat, I've never forgotten it. And you keep doing what you're doing. If you go to a nursing home, you don't do much. If you go to a retirement home, you don't do much. I live in my own house. I do my yard work. I transplant flowers. I plant them every year. I have a fellow that worked for us for 40 years. He's 75. He comes out, he's done roofing for me, repair. He just knows everything. He was raised on a farm with his mother very close to him. He just knows about everything, how to repair everything. And between the two of us, we just do whatever we got to do and laugh when we say, nobody's doing that anymore, but they're all dying. So don't keep, don't say, I can't do that anymore. Just keep doing it.
I wasn't sure what to expect when coming into Vet Dac. All I knew was that I was going to take on a huge responsibility, which was true. Throughout the year, I had this constant fear. Fear that my documentary wasn't going to get finished. Fear that it wasn't going to be good enough. But here I am with the finished documentary, and I could not have been happier with the way it turned out. I have sacrificed much of my time out of the weekends and days off school to work on Lillian's documentary. And if I had not done so, there would be no way the documentary would have been done. But when I first watched her raw interview, it amazed me how much she remembers for a person in her mid-90s. She can pinpoint a building down to the exact street it's on, and its exact position. Lillian reminds me of my own grandmother, as she continues to be active in keeping herself busy, and I hope to be healthy just like her one day. I have encountered struggles and mounting stress while working on my documentary, and when that happens, I just refer back to what Lillian says as she concludes her raw interview. Just keep doing what you're doing. That quote has stuck with me ever since, and that has helped me overcome the difficulties since I just kept doing what I was doing and had a consistent work ethic. Thank you, Lillian Brown, for being my unexpected role model and for contributing such a large part of your life to better this country, and I will keep doing what I'm doing.